I don't know about you, but when I hear the word moonshine, I think of jury rigged stills out in the woods turning out some sketchy liquids. So imagine my surprise when I found moonshine on the menu at numerous respectable craft distilleries. So what is this stuff? And can true moonshine really be made in both backwoods hideaways and boutique distilleries? Let's start with what moonshine is. Although some people call any illegally distilled spirit moonshine, the distillers we spoke to use the word to refer to unaged whiskey. Unlike conventional whiskey, which is aged in a wooden barrel for months or years, moonshine is bottled shortly after it's distilled. Moonshine got its rugged backwoods aesthetic around the turn of the 20th century, as more communities, and eventually the entire US, outlawed alcohol. Making high-proof hooch was a lucrative business, so long as you didn't get caught. Today, home distilling is still illegal in the US, but distilleries, with the proper licenses of course, can ply their craft openly. And modern Americans are all about craft everything. A spokeswoman for the American Craft Spirits Association, a trade group of distillers, told us there was a recent surge in craft distilleries opening to meet the growing demand. And selling unaged whiskey, aka moonshine, helped these young distilleries stay afloat while waiting for their conventional whiskey to age. You can learn more about aging in this video. But even as these craft aged whiskeys hit the market, Moonshine is sticking around, with many distillers continuing to make it as a standalone product. Now, the basic recipe for moonshine, yeast plus sugar equals ethanol, is the same whether you're an illicit moonshiner in prohibition times or a legit distillery today. But today's distilleries pride themselves on taste and quality control. In other words, making good moonshine means knowing your chemistry. We visited KO Distilling in Virginia to see and taste how modern chemistry has transformed the production of this potent spirit. KO Distilling first crushes a mixture of wheat and rye to expose the starches inside the grains. Then distillers mix the crushed grain with water and cook it at about 80 degrees Celsius. There's a certain temperature for each grain at which the starch will gelatinize, which is basically it absorbs water molecules. At that point, we can start attacking with our enzymes. Yeast are fantastic for making ethanol out of simple sugars, but they can't digest starch. You don't have um, facilities for that, so we kind of have to, I, what I tell people on tours is we're chewing their food for them. Hendrix uses the enzymes alpha amylase and gamma amylase to break down starches, long chains of glucose molecules, into simple sugars. He then transfers the mixture to a fermentation tank where yeast converts the sugars into ethanol. If everything goes well, the contents of the tank will be 10 to 15% alcohol by volume in a few days. Then it's time for distillation. KO distills spirits here in a still that takes advantage of the different boiling points of ethanol and water to vaporize ethanol while leaving most of the water and other stuff behind. As the vapor rises to the top of the still, it's diverted into a condenser and turned back into liquid, the distillate. An initial distilling run strips as much alcohol as possible from the spent grain. Then Hendrix puts the distillate from that first run through a finishing run to concentrate the ethanol and make the final product. But the moonshine isn't quite ready to drink after the second run. The condensed liquid still contains undesirable compounds, concentrated near the beginning and the end of the run. Hendrix diverts those early and late products into separate containers, leaving only that middle product to be bottled. Distillers refer to these three products as heads, hearts, and tails. The first product will be heavy in light, low boiling point alcohols. We've got um, methanol, isopropyl, all of your lower boiling point um, waste products and um, some bacterial contamination is always going to happen, so you will see a little bit of acetone and maybe um, acetaldehyde as well. So all of these compounds are highly volatile and have acrid and unpleasant characteristics. Characteristics like being able to poison you. After Hendrix discards the heads, he collects the hearts of the run. That's the good stuff, mostly ethanol and water. But as the run progresses, the ethanol concentration begins to drop and other compounds gain prominence. Hendrix must decide where to cut off the run to prevent too much of those compounds getting into the final product. The liquid that doesn't make the cut is called tails. Those are gonna be your longer chain alcohols and higher boiling point molecules. In small quantities, these are flavorful compounds and actually contribute some buttery elements, um, some of your more traditional whiskey flavors. At higher concentrations, they start to taste like soap and uh, other undesirable chemicals. So once that flavor kind of gets too strong, we'll call that tails, and we'll collect that separately the rest of the run. Um, unlike the heads, though, we save those, and we can redistill them later. What's left is a very high-proof spirit, and KO will dilute it before bottling. Hendrix said he would like to keep refining KO's distilling process, 
so he can reduce waste in the distilling runs and find the ideal conditions for his ethanol producing yeast. KO also recently added a continuous distillation system, which can handle larger production runs than the pot still we showed you earlier. This column is definitely not something Prohibition era moonshiners would have used if they were trying to stay under the radar. So now the important question. What does thoroughly modernized moonshine taste like? Cheers. <laughs> that does taste a lot like whiskey. Yeah. More than I expected. <laughs> so there you have it. Unaged whiskey tastes like whiskey. Like whiskey's edgier cousin. For more on the chemistry behind your favorite adult beverages, check out the links in the description. And let us know what you'd like us to cover next. If you've got ideas for a chemistry field trip, tell us about it in the comments.